Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Microneurography, Recording Nerve Traffic via Intraneural Microelectrodes in Awake Human Subjects. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's event. Our session is brought to us by AD Instruments and will focus on using microneurography as an invasive technique to study nerve activity and associated responses in human subjects. The presentation will be led by Vaughn Maysfield, Professor of Physiology at Mohammed bin Rashid University in Dubai and Professor of Integrative Physiology at Western Sydney University. Dr. Maysfield is known internationally as a world expert in recording the firing properties of human sympathetic neurons in health and disease and, is, and as a leading investigator in human sensomotor control. For over 10 years, Vaughn has been examining the changes in control of the autonomic nervous system following human spinal cord injury, extending his research into the study of pain and its effect on the autonomic and somatic nervous systems using brain imaging techniques, techniques such as fMRI to study the processing of pain. Professor Maysfield was also a leading consultant regarding the development of the NeuroAmp X extracellular amplifier, which he will be showcasing today. Today's presentation uh, will be a brief introduction to micronography technique and an overview of the associated equipment and methods for recording nerve response. Following a selection of applications, we'll be discussed to highlight common research applications and approach. And then we're going to have a Q&A session with Dr. Maysfield focused on the methods and application of, uh, of micronography as we've had a number of questions come in during the registration session. Uh, welcome everybody, I'm Vaughn Maysfield. I'm going to be talking about uh, micronography and specifically the use of uh, lab chart and AD Instruments NeuroAmp X for recording um, from peripheral nerves in awake human subjects. So as most of you are aware, micronography, which has been around for almost 50 years, was developed by Kalarek Habbath and Orca Valbo in Sweden, and it's contributed significant information on tactile and proprioceptive sensation, pain, sensory motor control, and control of the sympathetic nervous system. Tungsten microelectrodes can be inserted into any accessible peripheral nerve, usually the median or ulnar nerves at the wrist and the, or, or the upper arm, and these are useful rec for recording from tactile afferents and spindle afferents, etc. Um, the common perineal or tibial nerves at the knee, uh, and these are typically used for recording from sympathetic activity. Interestingly, the, the Japanese favor the tibial nerve at the knee. Uh, recordings have also been made at the serial nerve at the ankle, and in recent studies we've been recording from the posterior tibial nerve at the ankle, which allows us to record from muscle spindle endings in the intrinsic muscles of the foot and cutaneous afferents in the sole of the foot during standing. So that's an interesting area of our current research. Um, Microelectrodes can also be inserted into branches of cranial nerves, so they're not limited to just uh, peripheral nerves. Uh, so recordings have been made from the inferior alveolar nerve, uh, or the supraorbital branches of the trigeminal nerve, and my colleague Mats Trulsen in Stockholm in Sweden. He, was the, uh, he made the first recordings, he's a dentist by training, and he made the first recordings from the inferior alveolar nerve in the open mouth. And this is the nerve that is uh, blocked by a local anesthetic when you go for your lovely visits to the dentist. So as I mentioned, I'll be talking about the NeuroAmp X. Uh, many of you will be using, if you're, if, you, if you're currently performing micronography, you'll be used to the uh, Iowa system, the Iowa amplifier, which is based on the original amplifier developed in Uppsala by Kalarik Hagbath and his colleagues. And this is the same amplifier that I, I trained on, uh, David Burke in, in uh, Sydney. Uh, the NeuroAmp X is a new type of amplifier, and I was uh, involved as a consultant uh, providing the uh, system specs and testing all the prototypes, and it is a very good low noise amplifier. As you can see here, it's got a, a wide band pass, 100 hertz to 5 kilohertz, and importantly, a high signal to noise ratio. The head stage, which you can see here, this uh, stainless steel uh, cylinder and cable, 
um, provides uh, preamplification, gain of 100, and it also has a high pass filter of 10 hertz. The cable shielding is directly connected to the casing, and this limits the need for additional shielding of the input terminals. So the input terminals shown here uh, are very high impedance, and importantly, they have input protection circuitry. So if you are like me and you use intraneural uh, stimulation through the microelectrode, you can attach a small uh, mini alligator clip directly to the terminal of the active electrode and deliver currents up to one milliamp without fear of uh, damaging the circuitry. As you can see, the NeuroAmp X is safe for direct human uh, connection, making it ideal for micronography. But also the shape allows it to be used for animal research. So it was designed with this also in mind because it can fit into, for instance, a Narashigi uh, micromanipulator. And in my earlier days, um, I was, I was um, doing animal work, so I know that this sort of amplifier would be ideal for uh, extracellular recordings from uh, individual neurons in the brain or even from uh, peripheral nerves in anesthetized animals. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned, this can be, is, this is ideal for use in micronography, and this just shows how we would attach it to the leg of a subject shown here. Uh, you can use a Velcro strap to wrap it around the leg, the, around the calf, or as shown here, you can just tape it on. You don't need to put gel on the head stage, and in fact, you shouldn't put gel on the head stage because that could, you know, enter the terminals and uh, short circuit or even damage it. So don't put any uh, any gel here. What you can see in the green, the green lead is attached. We well, can't see it, but it's attached to a simple silver silver chloride surface electrode, just a stick-on ECG electrode over the knee or anywhere. There are two electrode points, two electrode uh, terminals. Let me just go back here, you can see here. So we have a ground lead uh, is attached here, and this is a differential amplifier. So one of the inputs is positive, the other is negative. We have a microelectrode inserted into the common perineal nerve, shown in this inset here. The blue mark simply indicates the site over the nerve um, that is defined as the, the best site for inserting the nerve. And we do that by, you know, sometimes you can palpate the nerve, but often, well always, we will use surface stimulation through a one to two millimeter uh, surface probe. We deliver cathode or currents, two to 10 milliamps. And uh, when we're over the nerve, then of course we're getting twitches of the innervated muscles and or paresthesia pins needles in the innervation territories of cutaneous fascicles. So we then mark the site, insert a microelectrode, the active recording microelectrode into that site and into the skin about a centimeter away, the inactive or reference electrode. Uh, these are commercially purchased microelectrodes. We get ours from Frederick Hare. Um, you can buy specific micronography needles, they call them. Um, these will typically have this wire attached and a little tape flag. I, I don't like the, the little flags because they tend to slide down. So I just purchased them with the gold male amphenol connector shown here. And I just make this little connecting wire out of uh, copper um, winding wire. It's, it's insulated. You need to scrape off the insulation in the last one or two millimeters and solder it to the, the pins that come with the amplifier. So the amplifier head stage comes with three male and three female pins. And you can order additional ones from uh, Frederick Hare or WPI. Typically, we will use a microelectrode that has gone through several cycles of use. Um, once its impedance becomes very low, we just use it as a reference electrode. We, uh, we will scrape about a millimeter off the tip. 
clean it and re-sterilize it. Now, some of you, uh, your uh, human ethics committees or institutional review boards may not allow uh, microelectro electrodes to be reused, re-sterilized, which I think is crazy. Uh, in which case, you can buy um, you can buy reference electrodes, so just bare reference electrodes from FHC. So this is a schematic of a peripheral nerve. As you will be aware, it's composed of distinct fascicles. Uh, the level of the knee, for instance, some will supply tibial anterior muscles, some extensor digitorum longus muscles, some will supply cutaneous fascicles. Here we have a representative uh, recording, an extracellular recording from a single muscle spindle ending in tibialis anterior. It is firing spontaneously. These are positive going spikes. And this is what we'd expect from a monopolar recording from a myelinated axon in which the microelectrode tip has got very close to or and has indeed uh, penetrated the myelin sheath of the axon. Uh, spontaneously active uh, discharge, which we have increased by applying stretch to the receptor bearing muscle, so just by passive plant flexion of the ankle will stretch the tibialis anterior muscle and activate, will increase the firing of this uh, spindle primary ending. In the lower recording, uh, this is uh, multi-unit activity from a bunch of C fibers, uh, specifically the unmyelinated axons supplying blood vessels uh, in the innervated skeletal muscle. So this is muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which is vasoconstrictor in function. As you can see, it has a very strong coupling to the ECG, so it exhibits strong cardiac rhythmicity. So this is a typical recording uh, obtained in my lab using the NeuroAmp amplifier and I hope I can convince you that the noise is very, very low indeed. I've used many amplifiers over the years. I've been doing micrography for some 30 years um, and often uh, you would need to apply a bit of aluminium foil over the, over the head stage just to just to uh, filter, just to block out any any electrical interference, the NeuroAmp X, however, does not require shielding. It is a very very low noise amplifier, and you can see here that the peak to peak noise is eight microvolts. If we look at the root mean square process, this is a root mean square moving average with a time constant of 200 milliseconds, you can see that the noise level is below 2 microvolts. And it is very hard to get lower than this because the background noise pretty much reflects the uh, thermal and electrical noise of the amplifier itself. So it's hard to get below this. So conclusion here is it's a very low noise amplifier. And this is an oligo unitary recording, so you can see the firing of individual uh, sympathetic axons, but we can see groups of axons firing here with a clear cardiac rhythmicity. Uh, using the amplifier, we can also, as I mentioned, record from myelinated axons. These are generating positive going spikes, unlike the negative going spikes of the sympathetic axons shown here. Uh, positive going spikes here recorded from a Golgi tendon organ afferent um, in tibialis anterior. Here we've got surface EMG recorded with the bioamp, uh, one of the front ends from uh, that connects to the power lab. And this is the root mean square, the RMS processed uh, mean voltage, so the, the mean activity of the EMG. In the lower trace we're recording dorsiflexion force and we have a little target shown here, and the subject is instructed to dorsiflex the ankle against the strain gauge and reach this this target force, which you can see uh, he, I think it was a he, does uh, adequately. And on the right, we can see that once he reaches the target force, the Golgi tendon organ maintains a constant firing rate. Now we can use um, the uh, 
uh, window discriminated software in Spike Histogram, which is some software uh, that one can uh, apply to the lab chart recorded data to extract the firing of this single unit. I'll come back to this, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate this later. Interestingly, and I'll also come back to this, you can see that within this recording you can see spontaneous bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. So sometimes we get this and it can, you know, for a recording where we're interested in, in, in the activity of the malinated afferent, afferent, this sort of activity can be a bit of a nuisance, but you'll see sometimes it can be beneficial. This is a recording I made in a, uh, a micrography workshop that I uh, ran in Telluride, Colorado um, last year. Uh, this is not an ideal laboratory situation. We've got a lot of we've got a, a, a power supply for this robotic manipulator here. Um, we've got the microelectrode inserted into my median nerve at the wrist, a ground electrode on my arm, and here's the head stage, reference electrode is just nearby. And basically, what you can see, let me just kill the sound, what you can see here is the spikes um, being generated by this fast adapting type 1 afferent on the finger pad. You can see the little black mark there shown here. And we've got a very good signal to noise ratio here. And as I said, this is not an ideal laboratory situation. This is just in a schoolroom, uh, despite which we've got very, very nice recording indeed. So using the NeuroAmpex, as I mentioned, we can, we can get very crisp recordings from single myelinated axons. This is a slowly adapting type 2 ending, a Rifuni ending in the finger pad. And here we're just applying a compressive force to the finger pad in each of these uh, positions and superimposing a rotational or torque force. And this just shows a screenshot from the window discriminated the spike histogram discriminator, where we can put a cluster, uh, uh, put windows around this cluster of spikes. We can see the individual spikes on the right. Uh, this is in the Macintosh version. I'm used to the Mac, but I should say that the Windows version has much better functionality. It has template matching, which is very very useful, and so you can you can. Uh, uh, you can remove spikes or, or insert spikes directly, so it's a very, very powerful software. So I actually went to the, uh, I went to the headquarters of AD Instruments in Dunedin and worked with the software engineers there to, to get that functionality built in. Unfortunately, it's not fully, uh, um, uh, fully applied to the Macintosh version yet, but nevertheless, as you can see here in the, the Mac version, that is still very much adequate for extracting very clean spikes from, from a recording. Many of you will be interested in muscle sympathetic nerve activity, and I'll show this example just because this subject displayed very, very nice and spontaneous fluctuations in arterial pressure recorded with the phenometer. And you can see that when there are spontaneous falls in blood pressure, there is a compensatory increase in muscle sympathetic nerve activity, an increase in muscle vasoconstrictor drive, which drives up blood pressure and then through the arterial barrier reflex, of course, inhibits this activity. It also causes a compensatory increase in heart rate. So using the NeuroAmpX, um, we can, and using the spike discriminator software, we can extract the negative going spikes, and I'll come back to why we do this. But here, what I've done is extracted the negative going spikes from this multi-unit recording of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. Here you can see the RMS processed nerve, so you can see these bursts and you could count these bursts. But here, what I've done is displayed uh, standard pulses, so unit events of 
the spikes being generated in this multi-unit recording. Down here, I've used the same uh, software to extract the R waves of the ECG, shown here. And in the lowest trace, I've used the same software to extract the positive peaks of the respiratory record. So we have events of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, all the spikes being generated, the R waves of the ECG, and the inspiratory peaks of the respiratory record. Now, well, you may ask why we are interested in getting that. Well, it gives you another way of analyzing muscle sympathetic nerve activity or skin sympathetic nerve activity for that matter. Here you can just record that you can just measure the, the, the burst frequency and burst incidence. You could measure the amplitudes. But by getting the spike timing of the sympathetic nerve activity and the event timing of ECG R waves and the inspiratory peaks, we can generate autocorrelation histograms and cross-correlation histograms. So we can look at the timing of the sympathetic spikes as a function of the timing of the R waves and as a function of the timing of the inspiratory peaks. And this is shown here. If we look on the right panel, just in panel D, time zero here for all panels represents the, the uh, time at which the event occurs. So here, this is the first R wave. And this on the right shows the timing of the subsequent R wave and the following R waves to the right and the preceding R waves to the left. Now, if this was you know, a patient with a pacemaker, this would be very tight. These peaks would be very tight. But because this is a, a healthy individual, then there is some variability, normal heart rate variability. And we can see this in the, the broad peaks of the, uh, of the spike timing. This is just shown to illustrate the basic cardiac rhythm in this individual. But on the top, what we've done is generated a cross-correlation histogram between the MSNA and the ECG. And you can see that the dominant peak uh, corresponds to that which would be uh, most closely coupled to the R wave, one and a half heartbeats previously, about 1.2, 1 1.3 seconds previously. So this just shows the, the marked cardiac rhythmicity of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. We can go in and we can measure the total number of, of spike counts there. So we can, this is another way of quantifying muscle sympathetic nerve activity, not from the RMS processed or integrated nerve, but from the raw nerve signal itself. Likewise, on here, we've got the autocorrelation histogram of the respiration, the inspiratory peaks time zero and the next, uh, the, the breath afterwards and the one after that and preceding. And again, this shows that this signal has very nice respiratory modulation as well as cardiac modulation, though of course the cardiac mod modulation is, is greater. And we can see the same thing with skin sympathetic nerve activity as well. Now, I mentioned that occasionally we will get uh, recordings in which we have muscle sympathetic nerve activity in uh, infiltrating a, an afferent recording. Depending on what your, where your uh, area of interest lies, you may find the muscle afferent to be an inconvenience, or you may find the muscle sympathetic re recording to be an inconvenience. For me, I think it's great when we get recordings like this because you can actually get two recordings for the price of one. I'll actually come back to this particular example in the software demonstration. We'll go through it in detail. Suffice to say that here, I've extracted the sympathetic spikes, the negative going spikes, and the positive going spikes, and the peaks of this sinusoidal galvanic vestibular stimulation. This com comes from some work we've been doing over the last few years where we're applying a weak electrical current behind the ears and it induces uh, strong vestibular illusions of rocking in a boat, or swinging in a hammock. And basically, again, using uh, the 
cross-correlation histogram and autocorrelation histogram functions of spike histogram, we can look at the modulation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity as a function of this vestibular input. We've previously shown that it doesn't have any effect on the spindles, but it does cause marked modulation of muscle sympathetic nerve activity here. As you can see, for three different frequencies at 0.08 hertz, 0.13 hertz, and 0.18 hertz. And we, see, we also see this modulation when we're recording skin sympathetic nerve activity. So again, by performing cross-correlation uh, analyses, you can get very rich data from a multi-unit recording. So there's more in the signal than is, a, than is obtained just by simply recording the number of, uh, measuring the number of bursts per 100 heartbeats or per minute. Now, many of you will also be aware that using very high impedance microelectors, we can record from single uh, sympathetic axons. The, this is technically very difficult, of course, because the axons tend to travel in the, in the in a fascicle as a group. So the idea is to get the electrode tip as close as possible to one uh, axon in which the, the generated spike stands out from the noise. And here we've got a muscle vest constricted neuron just firing spontaneously. And we've got uh, the asterisks indicate when the unit is firing. And here in the inset, we've just superimposed the spikes. And you can see that this has a uniform spike morphology. We can also see far field activity. And here in the integrated nerve, which is similar to the RMS process nerve, we can see this far field activity. So we can get an idea of the population activity as well as the single unit activity. We can see what happens when we ask the subject to, to increase the muscle sympathetic nerve activity during a physiological maneuver such as a maximum inspiratory breath hold. And this is why you can see the respiration is flat here. The subjects have been asked to take a maximum inspiratory breath hold and inspiratory capacity apnea, which causes a sustained and marked increase in muscle sympathetic nerve activity. Again, we can see this great increase in activity from the integrated nerve, the, the far field activity being picked up by the same microelectrode gives, an gives us a, an idea of what the population of neurons is doing. But by having the microelectrode tip close to one axon, closer to one axon than the other axons, we can see that these spikes which stick out from the background and su are superimposed here give us an idea of what individual neurons are doing. And as you can see, individual neurons, and this is a common feature we have uh, found, are generally firing once and only once per cardiac interval. Occasionally they fire two to three times, four times within a cardiac interval. We can, we can look at different uh, disease states. Uh, so I've looked at obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension and heart failure. Elizabeth Lambert, the Baker Institute in Melbourne, she's done a lot of work on, on different disease states, including uh, panic disorder and obesity and hypertension. And basically the pattern is, is very uniform across labs, individual neurons, tend to fire once per burst, but as you can see, they can occasionally fire multiple times, although this is rare. Now, at the outset, I mentioned that the, the head stage of the NeuroAmp X is made of high-grade stainless steel. And this is actually advantageous because we were thinking, oh, maybe we can, we can use this in the scanner because we'd been doing some brain imaging work and we were interested in identifying sources of the brain responsible for generating uh, bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity or bursts of skin sympathetic nerve activity. And like most people at the time, we'd been using physiological maneuvers in the scanner that we could 
also use in the lab. So we'd get recordings of the physiological changes in the lab, including what muscle sympathetic nerve activity or skin sympathetic nerve activity is doing. And then in the same subjects, we'd put them in the MRI machine and scan the brain and use the same maneuver. We asked the question, well, would it be possible to record uh, the sympathetic outflow at the same time as scanning the brain? And basically, uh, we managed to do that. So, and the idea here, here is that um, by correlating bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity or skin sympathetic nerve activity with brain activity, uh, we could identify regions in the brain responsible for generation of this activity. And we've looked at patients with sleep apnea as well, and we're currently looking at patients with, uh, with hypertension. So MSNA coupled fMRI or SSNA coupled fMRI allows us to identify these regions of the brain that are temporarily coupled to the bursts of MSNA or SSNA. If you imagine the bursts that we're recording from the microelectrode in the peripheral nerve, you imagine these bursts are like flashes of a lighthouse beacon. And you imagine that there are many lighthouse beacons flashing in the brain. By recording the two signals together, we can see which of the lighthouse beacons are flashing together and therefore which of the areas are temporally coupled. So this shows a recording from a sleep apnea patient about to go in the scanner. We have the, the neuroamp. Uh, attached to the leg, exactly, th everything's the same, there's no shielding here. Um, this is the the head coil, 32-channel uh, head coil, and this is a 3T scanner. We've also been doing this uh, in Nottingham using a 7T scanner. We, uh, we are planning to do the same in, in the 7T facility in Melbourne. Anyway, um, this was the very first recording we took, and we thought that we would, uh, the, there'd be a lot of noise. And so what we did is we, we thought, well, should we put a bit of aluminium foil over? Well, we, we didn't bother, but uh, this was the first recording. We've got scanning artifacts here, and we've got a lot of noise here. We were really worried about all this noise. But then, like good neurophysiologists, we thought, well, maybe we can filter that out. So this is now the same recording. Uh, with a high-pass filter, 300 hertz high-pass filter. I'll just go back, I've got all this noise down here, um, but you can make out a burst there, and when we filter it, you can actually make out two bursts. So simple high-pass filtering applied offline. So we, we now apply this routinely, so as soon as the recording finishes, 300 hertz uh, a high-pass filter kicks in and removes the overall background noise. We can then use this feature called peak parameters. We can highlight a burst. We can measure its amplitude, its width, its area, anything we want we can, we can measure. And what we've been doing is uh, we've been using a four-second on, four-second off uh, scanning period. We record this 200 times. Basically, this takes advantage of the delays inherent in uh, blood oxygen level dependent signal in the brain. So basically, an electrical event in the brain, a neural event, um, is followed about five seconds later by the blood oxygen level dependent increase in signal intensity. Because neurons, when they're active, they require more oxygen, which is delivered by the blood. And um, because uh, blood contains hemoglobin, which carries the oxygen, of course, and hemoglobin contains iron, it has a paramagnetic quality. I won't go into the physics of it. Suffice to say that there is a signal, a bold signal, that is used as a proxy marker of neural activity in the brain. We also know that it takes about a second for that neural event in the brain to travel to the peripheral recording site at the knee because these are slowly conducting axons and it takes about a second to travel from the brain uh, down to the recording site. So five seconds, bold signal, minus one second, 
for the nerve conduction signal leaves us with four seconds. So what we've done here is we just measure the burst activity in every one second epoch in this four second off period where we're, we can actually see the nerve activity and jump ahead in time to the brain scanning and look within the brain at the bold signal that is occurring four seconds after the one second period of interest. I shan't go into the details here. Suffice to say that when we use this approach, we can see areas that are temporally coupled to the bursts of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, such as ventromedial hypothalamus, dorsomedial hypothalamus, cingulate, precuneus, and we can see in these uh, cross-sections, again, these areas of the hypothalamus, uh, torsomedial and ventromedial hypothalamus, we can also see deep cerebellar nuclei, the anterior insula, etc. So these are areas, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, these are areas that just pop out from the analysis, there's no region of interest here, so these are just temporally coupled to the, bur to the spontaneous burst of MSNA, therefore they are likely to be contributing to the burst of muscle sympathetic nerve activity. I'm going to start with, um, uh, can you record nerve activity from multiple sites simultaneously? Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, um, of course you need uh, two amplifiers, but we often um, record from the left nerve and the right nerve, so we have two neuro amps and they they work very well. It's obviously you just have to get into two nerves and that mm -hmm. takes a bit longer. Um, you could also record from the same nerve, you know, so at a distal and a more proximal site, this would be trickier getting into, the, if you want to get into the same fascicle, but it, it's definitely doable and um, there's no issue with respect to um, uh, compatibility between the recordings from two, two neuroamp amplifiers okay. recorded at the same time, yeah. Perfect, okay, and then this leads us into our next question because I'm, I'm sure the there's maybe additional challenges if you go to recording multiple sites, but uh, a number of questions have come in. How does one determine uh, the proper location of the needle to ensure consistent and accurate measurements? Uh, yeah, so um, one thing you should be aware of is that when recording muscle sympathetic nerve activity, for instance, um, the 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 amplitude of the signal depends on the proximity of the electrode tip to the active axons. Now, you can't just get one subject and record from that nerve, um, you know, a, a week or two later, well, we usually wait uh, four weeks before entering the same nerve, um, you can't record and expect that amplitude to be a consistent representation over time because, as I mentioned, the amplitude depends on how close the electrode tip is to the active axons. However, many people um, will normalize the burst to the largest burst recorded in that recording session. So if you call that 1,000, say, the largest burst you've recorded and normalize everything to that, then you can look at the distribution of amplitudes from one session to another. And But this is why most people are interested in just a very rudim well, rudimentary but powerful uh, means of, of assessing sympathetic airflow, which is simply to record the number of bursts per 100 heartbeats, burst incidence, or the number of bursts per minute burst frequency. Now using single unit recordings, which is of course trickier because you have to make very, very fine adjustments of the microelectrode tip so you get close to one and only one axon. Um, the nature of that signal is quantal, 
mean, what I mean by that is that you've either got a spike or you haven't. And so with that approach, you can just recall, you can compare the, the signal from one subject to another because what you're interested in is the firing probability of a neuron, how, how many times per cardiac interval does it fire, etc., and the frequency. So using the single unit approach, you can uh, compare recordings between individuals. But using a multi-unit recording, it's much more difficult to use anything other than uh, temporal measure, measurements, that is burst frequency or burst incidence. Perfect. Um, no, that's a very good answer. Perhaps on this topic of, again, training or just learning the fundamental skills, what do suggestions do you have, Vaughn, for people that are new, new to microneurography and want to start? Oh, look, I think this, that's a very good question. Um, look, you know, micronography has been around for 50 years now. Um, there are many people in the world doing it, but it's still a technique that is, is, is very specialist. It is not something you can just try at home. You need to be trained by a proficient micronographer. I, you know, in, in my lab, I, I, I take students every year and it, and it takes me, you know, uh, a couple of months to train them. Um, and, but they'll still need to be making the recordings under, under supervision. It takes quite a while to become proficient. It, it, it's not an impossible technique to learn. Uh, it, it requires you to, one, experience it as a subject, and two, to be trained into inserting and manipulating a microelectrode into uh, a nerve because you're, you're inserting. This is an invasive procedure. It's very safe, but um, it is potentially unsafe in unskilled hands. So you need to identify uh, an investigator who uses it and ask for training.